So, if I have got this right, we should now be live on Wild Ginger Running. And I am just going to play the trailer and then I'm going to introduce you a very special guest for this evening who is called Holly Page. So I'm just going to play the trailer and then uh, it all will be revealed. So, here we go. Uh, sadly, there's no music because I don't know why, <laughs> but here we go. That's the trailer. So... Oh, intro. Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to Wild Ginger Running Live. We've got the first ever 2019 trail chat now. So this lady is the Sky Running World Series Classic Champion. Uh, she came third in the Golden Trail Series overall. She was top 10 and first GB runner at the Trail World Championships. So joining us for our first ever trail chat of 2019, please welcome Holly Page. Hi Ollie. Hi. Hello. Thank you very much for joining us here on the first ever trail chat of 2019. Um, and congratulations, first of all, on such a fantastic 2018 season. Um, so I just wanted to ask you if any of those races stood out as particularly special in your mind. Um, so I did one of those calculations of how many races I've done last year, and I actually ran 35 races last year. Um, yeah. Uh, oh, sorry, you're a little bit quiet still. Okay. Um, oh, that's better. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so I loved races last year, um, but yeah, there were definitely, definitely some standout races. Um, I went to China um, for the first sky running race of the, of the year, um, yeah. and that was running at almost 5,000 meters, which was fairly crazy. I'd not done that before. Um, but awesome. Awesome experience, met some awesome people, ran in my shorts and t-shirt in a blizzard of 5,000 meters. Um, but it was cool, <laughs> I'd probably go back again. Um, and then like the Trail World Champs was definitely a highlight. Um, my aim before that race was just to finish the race. Like I was really surprised to even be picked at all to be on the team um, and felt totally out of my depth because um, I'd never... like. I think it was 35 kilometers further than I'd ever run in my life. Really? <laughs> wow, yeah. that's incredible. Um, but yeah, I just kind of soldiered on and started hallucinating and all sorts towards the end. But like finishing that and then being in the top 10 was pretty, pretty good standout, I guess. Um, that's awesome. And yeah, then there were all like just so like so many races this year. Um, going out to the to the US as well was really cool. I'd, I'd not been in that part of the world and. When I'm racing, I like to take the opportunity to go and explore different places. So the races which take me to cool places I've not been to definitely are, are highlights for me. Um, but also, like I finished off the season at the Otter Trail in South Africa. Um, and I used to live in South Africa, actually. So um, I, I hadn't been to th that exact part. Uh, but it was really, really nice to go back and, um, and, and see people, like old friends there as well, um, and the race went quite well too, I won that one, <laughs> so... Um, Amazing! So, yeah, but yeah, it's hard to pick like one standout race, but oh, also I ran, there was a race called the Monterosa Sky Marathon. Oh, wow, yeah, I've heard of that one, it sounds amazing. It's kind of a mixture of like, well, mountaineering-ish um, and running. Um, you go up to up Monterosa, which is Europe's second highest mountain, um, and you do it with a partner, um, and I'd actually not run with a partner before um, so I did it with a good friend of mine um, and it could have been make or break in the friendship but it was definitely make um, it was one of those <laughs> perfect mornings where the sun was shining we were like roped together up on top of the glacier and um, yeah just yeah really cool um, so yeah it's been a pretty good year really in terms of running <laughs> um, so so yeah I can't complain Amazing. Yeah, and it's just so um, amazing because when I was researching you, it um, and this came as a surprise to me because when I met you at the Glencoe Skyline, you didn't say anything about this, but you had quite um, a nasty slide down a glacier not that long ago, didn't you? Um, yeah, yeah, that was in 2017. 
Yeah, um, so not that yeah. long ago. Yeah, um, it, yeah, it wasn't um, that doing that Monte Rosa race kind of brought back <laughs> some not so happy memories of that. But, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that was like um, a bit of a, a silly accident, really. I was I was not meant to be in the Alps. Um, I was actually working out in Ethiopia, um, and um, my flight was delayed there. So um, I was actually on my way to the first sky running race of 2017 for me um, in in in, um, in Greece. Um, but anyway, I was stuck in stuck in Addis because my flight was delayed, which meant when I got to my transfer in Turkey, um, my I'd miss the onward flight. So they said, oh, well, like, you can go tomorrow. I was like, well, the race is tomorrow. So, <laughs> like, <laughs> there's no, not really much point. <laughs> different kinds of places to go, and one of them was Geneva. Um, and I had friends in Chamonix, so I was like, oh, okay, fine. I missed the sky race, but I'll go and have fun with some friends in the mountains. Um, so, yeah, some friends in the mountains decided to invite me along on their trip at Mont Blanc. And um, we, we got, like, a third of the way up and then the weather was really bad so we turned around which was wide um, but I we then came back down a, a different way down a glacier and um, like none of us put the crampons on uh, we've got ice axes out um, but yeah I had my crampons in my bag and my helmet in my bag but not on my feet or on my head and um, so just towards the top of the glacier I then um, like hit some ice and just started sliding 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 which was yeah, quite probably the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. Um, yeah. Instead of basically instead of going to my first car running race of the series of the year, I ended up in hospital and coming back to the UK not able to walk. Oh my goodness! You get to see the inside of planes from a different angle. Like you get to go in the wheelchair, like a thing that picks you up. <laughs> so yeah, I mean to be honest, I was quite lucky really to come out of that. Um, in one piece because I was it was really stupid like, it was uh, I've learned a lot from that it made me initially think like mm, why do we bother going to the mountains taking these risks and things um, but um, and they were in my case there they were avoidable risks so um, so yeah I'll be back I've been back in the mountains <laughs> and wearing crumbles yeah um, yeah, a lesson for everyone there then. That's amazing. I just, um, could, uh, the sound's a little bit low still. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> if you, we'll just have a huge face. Maybe I'll do it too and we'll both be like big faces on the screen. <laughs> we'll both look the same. My face is not the nicest thing to look at really. But... <laughs> no, it's really lovely. Um, yeah, just say, uh, say something again. Say, um, hello everybody. Yes, that's cool. Yeah, we can hear you from there. That's well, awesome. I'll just lean into the screen. Yeah, if you want to exchange my face for a photograph. That's <laughs> well, I do actually have some photographs of you that I can show to everybody. Um, so after that um, uh, incredibly uh, distressing, I would have thought, incident, you went on <laughs> to not only compete in a ton of sky races and countless other races besides, but win some of them and, and rank really highly. So I just got a few of your little highlights here. So this is Holly in Limone. Um, so she was up there with the leaders, um, but uh, held on to fourth place. So that is awesome. And then we have the sky racing where Holly, that's where I met you, Holly. And I, um, uh, yeah, so then you won the Sky Classic category of the Sky Race series there, um, which is absolutely amazing. That's there, you there with Pascal Egli. And then you went on to totally smash up the Otter Trail. And um, I think, yeah, I'm just reading it there. You've got a new course record on the Otter Trail as well, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, but then this is my absolute favourite picture of you. And it's you dressed as a Christmas present. I just thought this was amazing. I just thought it was amazing how you had to shimmy the box up over your eyes to clamber over the fences, <laughs> like it says in your post. Um, when you think about standout races, that's probably my, actually that was like, I finished it and I was like, oh, that's my favourite race of the year. Like, yeah. I mean, it's great going to all these places all around the world and I'm very grateful for, for those opportunities. Um, but at the end of the day, like, I'm a fell runner and I love just going out um, and the camaraderie that there is in the UK here. Um, all the fell races and yeah, what better way to 
to end the year other than dressing up as a Christmas present and running around in the mud. Was anybody else dressed up at that race? Uh, yeah, there were other people. There were no other presents because I was a little concerned that I might have some present competition. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I was outdone by a guy in like an inflatable Santa suit. Um, he he would have. Like, I mean, I couldn't fit through gates, but he definitely wouldn't be able to fit through the gates. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really funny. There should have been like a giant Christmas pudding as well. That would have been good. Um, I've just I've got a few more photos of you fell running just here. So this is Holly back on home turf, um, and uh, there's another one just here. If I can just work this thing out, yeah, there you go. Um, this is what it says here. This is the Shepherd Skyline Fell race, and that was what you love most of all. So yeah, loads and loads of running, um, and I've just got um, uh, one of the patrons has asked a question. So Guy Greaterx says. How does it feel when you are passing and finishing ahead of most men? So, yeah, good question there from Guy. What do you think, Holly? Um, to be honest, like, when I'm, when I'm in a race, I'm usually like, racing the women. Um, and that's what I find quite funny in that the men who are not necessarily at the front of the race, their, like, next aim is to then beat the first woman or beat beat a woman like I think the men tend to have more incentive to beat a woman than they do to beat other men around them um, but then from my perspective I don't have that much incentive to beat the men as such so <laughs> they all put on like extra sprints at the end to try and beat me or beat a woman um, and yeah I, I find it quite I find that quite funny that then like I'm not going to necessarily react to that um, but I've had a few races this year where like I did one race in, in the summer where I managed to win the race outright, um, which was quite cool. Wow, uh, which one was that? Um, it was called the Saddleworth Round. Um, so after that, they, the race organiser, because um, I broke the record, um, well, it was a new race, so obviously the record <laughs> the record went, no, it was the third, no one else had done it. Um, so then the race organiser was like, oh, so should we write you down as having like the like the men's record I said well no so just make the women's record faster than the men's record so yeah yeah <laughs> totally um, and then like in December I won a park run oh, I know it's only a park run um, but by one second I had a little sprint finish with a man at the end um, oh cool to do, to do my bit for womankind um, but yeah I mean I don't every like it does yeah it's nice to beat some men but it's nice to beat some women or like I'm always going to be beaten by other people as well. Like, I, I don't, I don't really, um, I don't really think about it too much. I don't think like, oh yes, I beat all the men. <laughs> <laughs> but it is nice if a man does a sprint finish. Like, when, actually, in my box, that felt more satisfying. Beating yeah, I bet. <laughs> awesome. I've got another question here from um, another patron called John Gardner, who's watching here as well. I can see he's already written some comments. And um, and he wants some advice. He says the advice that he really needs from you, Holly, has less to do with running and more to do with your lovely sense of humour. So how do you zig when everyone else zags? How do you set your own stuff aside to find the fun in life, no matter how, how scary, risky or painful? Um, I guess I have like a fairly leveled outlook on life. Like, um, like running, yes, I take it seriously, but I've I've spent a lot of time overseas and travelling, and, and I work in international development, which really opens your eyes up to other things in the world, um, and kind of helps you to put a bit of perspective on everything. Um, and yeah, I mean, like. We're always reminded that life's too short, um, unfortunately. Um, so I think I don't know. I've learned from a fairly young age just to, to make the most of what we have and like live each day to the full. Um, and so yeah, I don't like. Yes, I take I take my work seriously. I take running seriously. I take everything else that's going on fairly seriously, but all with a with a lot of with a bit of perspective um, and and try to see the funny side of things as well. Um, when things go wrong, yeah, it's, it's all right. You can usually find a way out. Um, and yeah, things tend to go quite wrong um, a lot of the time, but you find that's how you learn. That's how you find solutions. Um, so, so yeah, I, I like to hopefully try and be reasonably balanced and not ever be on a start line feeling totally stressed or 
like worried if somebody beats me in a race like eh, it's only running at the end of the day <laughs> the hill the fastest and run back down again um so so yeah i don't know if that answers the question what yeah no that's really good that's a really good attitude as well i think i think a lot of people could take a lot from that that's really awesome um and so there's another question from guy greaterx here so he says um when you're in a race or on a training run and you don't feel that you're best or the weather's really bad and you just want to go home um what do you tell yourself to keep yourself motivated and complete what you set out to do um i guess there's all sorts going on in my head like I I always play some play mental games of just like breaking things down into little chunks and then thinking, okay, well I've got to get to the end of this bit or if it's a long race, say I'll break it down into five kilometer chunks and then I just think, okay, well, you can run five kilometers, that's fine. And then you run that five kilometers and you say, Oh, you can run five kilometers and you do another five. Um, and just yeah, just pushing on. I mean the, the going gets tough quite <laughs> quite a lot. Um, but it's just it's knowing that the pain will end at some point um, and that if you like I don't know I've I've, I've never dropped well, actually no I've dropped out of one race before um, I think when I was like 10 um, it was a junior fell race and we all the, all the junior races start running around the field um, and yeah I just remember being like right at the back so I pretended that I felt really sick and I was like oh no I've got a stitch I can't run <laughs> so I dropped out but that was my that's the only race otherwise like I mean, I've had so many stomach issues and like mega dehydration and all sorts of races, but you just, I guess you just have to get on with it. And um, it's amazing what the body can do, actually. And that's how you, again, that's how you learn. You, you, you learn that even when you think you've got nothing left to you, you usually have. Um, and at the end of the day, I mean, what I'm doing is not really like extreme in, uh, compared to what some people are suffering and having to do. There's always somebody worse. Yeah, yeah, it's always good to keep it into perspective, isn't it? Wise words indeed. Um, and we have another question here from Guy, Greater X again. Um, when you're injured and can't run, like um, the Glacier thing in 2017, how do you cope with that? Like, what stops you from getting down and do you do any other activities to keep your fitness up and your mind sane? Um, I actually sometimes quite like it when I'm injured because it means I don't have to go and run. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, like that time when I'd had that, the, I tore a ligament in my knee, so I, I, was, I couldn't, I couldn't straighten it or bend it properly. I was just kind of immobile for a little while. Um, and yeah, I just sit around and eat cake. Um, <laughs> Lovely. I mean, like, so many other things you can do. Like, I mean, I'm, I work, I work as well, so I just like do more work and. Um, I like play music as well, so like play my violin a bit, um, take the opportunity to see people. Um, like out of any, out of some bad, something you can always find something good. There's no point sitting around going, oh no, I can't run, my knees sore, or like for me, like that with that accident, the most annoying thing was actually that um, I'd just been training so hard over the winter um, when I was I was living out in South Africa and travelling around Africa. And um, and doing like 5 a.m. sessions on the treadmill in the basement in a hotel somewhere um, just to get fit and then you just see that fitness ebbing away is quite frustrating when you think of like some of the sacrifices you've made um, usually sleep being the sacrifice um, but uh, yeah I mean uh, there's, all, there's always other things to do so I don't I, don't, I, I, I would I'd never want running to be like the only thing in life. Um, I think it's really important to have lots of other things going on, and that that also helps to give you that perspective as well. Yeah, so it's almost giving you time when you do get injured. It's giving you time to like branch out and do other things that you sacrifice, like the violin. I, I love that you play the violin. I didn't. I had no idea you played the violin. Not, not particularly well, but uh, <laughs> get out much unless I've had too much wine. Um. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, we'll have to have a get together. I play the flute, so we'll have to do some jigging sometime. <laughs> That's true. 
Um, I've got a, a question from Helen Blakemore now. Um, so she wants to know, in, in a similar theme to uh, the getting injured, um, she says, what's your process for recovery after these very long runs and ultras? Um, she's tried various things, but some are better than others. Um, but she'd love to hear what you personally do to recover. Um, so, I mean, normally I will have like a day off after a race. Um, uh, if, it, if it's possible, I'll like sit in a cold river, um, which um, which I find helps with your helps with your muscles. It but definitely it helps. I've done that. Yeah. Um, it, I'm not very good with cold water though. People think I'm tough, but I'm really not when it comes. To <laughs> I feel like get my legs in, but that's about it. Um, uh, blah, 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 recovery. Um, yeah. So like. I, it, I think it's good to, to keep active though, like even just going for a walk or a bike ride or something, just to keep your legs ticking over, especially if they've had a, a real hammering. Um, but yeah, and also um, I found that um, often that you feel okay the day after a, a long race, um, but actually your legs will start to hurt like a couple of days later. So it's quite important not to fit, like you, you're still on a high from the race usually, um, you think, oh, I'll go out for a long run the next day or something, um, and your legs feel okay, but then it will hit you afterwards, and that's kind of when the injuries come. Um, but saying that, this year I, I did like back to back, lot, like every weekend I was doing these long races, um, and that uh, makes your legs strong, I guess. <laughs> but, um, Were you doing much in the week then? No, I wasn't doing that much in between. Um, I got really unfit in a weird way, uh, in that. I would run a bit, I'd run a race on like the Sunday and then maybe I'd, I'd be able to like do a session on the Wednesday of the midweek but then nothing much else because then I'd have another race like on the Saturday. Um, but yeah I think it's important just like get, I mean I've been running since I was really young so like I feel like I know my body, I know if I'm tired or not. Um, also eating lots is really important, <laughs> making sure you're fueling both before and after a race. Um, it's amazing how much, how much your, well, it's amazing how much, how little your body can get by on in a race. I sometimes like <clears throat> back, okay, well, I've just been running for five hours and I've had like three gels or something. Um, but then I make up for that with how much I eat, like when I get to the finish. Um, but yeah, I think that's really important. Making sure you're hydrated as well really helps uh, the muscles to recover. Yeah. Non-scientific. Um, <laughs> A, a beer or two, yeah. <laughs> yeah, about, I was literally about to say, and drink a beer. That's, yeah, that's probably the best. Next to a party after a race, um, that's that's quite important to be at the party because it's really good boosting up the muscle. Yes, it's a good stretching session. And yeah, we like get low on the dance floor. Good. <laughs> Definitely. Um, and so, Run Simon Run has a question. Um, uh, well, he wants to know well, in a, what you were just talking about how you reward yourself after a hard race or run. Um, like, do you have a go to treat like ice cream or cake, or what's your favourite? Um, I definitely eat ice cream and cake in great quantity, but I also eat them in great quantity when I'm not doing a race. <laughs> um, so, it's not specifically for a race. I think I don't. I don't, in terms of like food, for example, I don't not eat stuff. I mean, we're, I'm running a lot, so I feel like that's why I run, so I can eat lots. Um, so, um, so yeah, I don't specifically have a, a treat or anything after a race. Um, I just have a, a really a good feeling, and I, and I guess like you can eat um, whatever you want really, and not feel guilty at all about it. Or, um, yeah, um, yeah, I, I, and like I don't know, I. I Usually at races, there's lots of people that you know as well, um, so it's always a good opportunity to have a few beers and things with them and just like discuss the intricacies of who felt bad or good in which part of the race. <laughs> um, but yeah, in terms of, I don't have like a specific celebration or anything. Um, usually just get over like like an hour or so, for an hour or so after a race, if it's been a really hard race, I feel like awful and can't eat anything. Um, but then once you come around, it's, usually, it's all right. Um, after the otter in South Africa, I actually got really drunk on the finish line because um, <laughs> I'm dehydrated and someone gave me a bottle of champagne um, at the end. So I was just like drinking the champagne, but obviously I hadn't eaten anything. Or <laughs> so, um, so yeah, that was beware of champagne. If ever you <laughs> it's the bubbles. It's the bubbles, I'm sure. <laughs> um, 
uh, Helen Blakemore has another question. Um, uh, is, you kind of already answered it in a way, um, in that you said you might just have three gels over five hours, but she wants to know what you take with you for nutrition. Um, so maybe you could talk a bit about the difference between what you'd take, say, on just a nice run with a friend, like a whole day run, or versus what you'd take on a race with you, nutrition-wise. Um, I find so, like, if I'm going for a long, long run with a friend, um, in fact, I just, I just did two days of long run with a friend. We ran uh, a route called the Caldervale Way over New Year, so we ran, like, my house is halfway along the route, so we ran, like, half the way on the afternoon of New Year's Eve, and then the morning um, we ran, um, ran the second bit. Um, and yeah, actually we we both um, are involved with a, a little Yorkshire company called Chia Charge, who make really good flapjacks. Oh yeah, um, I love them. We did the whole that whole run just with the, the Chia Charge flapjacks, which was, which was great. How um, many of them? Pardon? How many flapjacks? How many? Hmm. Uh, I think like, probably like five of those big ones. Um, yeah. Oh, they're really delicious, aren't they? I took them with me on the Coastal Challenge. Um, oh, you don't, the Coastal, like the Costa Rica Coastal Challenge. Yeah, yeah, I did, um, I missed one day because uh, I got fed up and sick. <laughs> I had some food poisoning thing, but yeah, I did sit five of the six days, yeah. Okay, I should talk to you afterwards because I'm Oh, going are you going to do it? Yeah, I'm going in like two weeks. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's totally. Well, we can talk about it on the live as well. Like, it'd be interesting for people. Um. Anyway, going back to the so like if it's a, if it's a, a long slow run, I find I can eat normal food. Um. And actually, when I was training for the World Trail, um, I was doing some longer runs. Um. And I was like experimenting with different food things. So I would like take weird bowls of rice, like plastic bags of rice and things with me uh, and then but I actually find I mean I'm not doing crazy ultras like some people um, I find like in the in a, most of my races are about five hours more or less and so for those five hours you're running really hard um, mm -hmm. and I can't eat proper food um, I can drink drinks with some sugary stuff in them um, and, and have gels but like in terms of actually being able to swallow a bar I find it really difficult um, yeah Whereas on something longer, then then you you're breathing a bit less heavily and and you have a little bit more time as well to, to eat something a bit a bit more proper. Um, but yeah, I usually just get by on gels and things. But it's it's a weird scenario because you kind of try and eat vaguely healthily the rest of the time, and then you get to a race and it's just wow, how much sugar can I shove? Yeah. <laughs> But never get particularly um, like scientific about it. You know, like a lot of people will kind of measure or like exactly how many calories they'll be burning each hour, and therefore how many grams of uh, fructose and glucose, whatever they need. Um, I just make sure I have a, a reasonable stash with me, and, and, and have them when I'm. Well, usually forcing myself to have them even when I don't feel like I, I need them necessarily, just to avoid feeling bad. Um, but equally, I've done quite a lot of runs where I don't take much with me at all, and it's a good way of teaching your body to get through when it's <laughs> when it's got nothing. Um, but yeah, that's probably not good advice. Yeah. Uh, no, I really like the way that you're not like dead, um, you know, like uh, boring and scientific about it all. You just go, well, I'll just try and eat this thing now. And, and I like the way in one interview that I've read about you, um, you said you don't really have a training plan. And I thought, well, that's really refreshing. Like that makes running so much more organic and easier, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's hard to get myself out the door, like when it's miserable weather outside. Um, in fact, not sometimes, always. Um, but. Once I'm out, then it's usually fine. Um, but it's like that kind of like, yeah, trying to get yourself out of the door is, is never easy. Um, yeah, just people think like, oh, just because you run like reasonably quickly, you you love running and you love like going out training on every run. Like, no, not at all. <laughs> um, it's as hard for every, like for me as it is for everyone. Um, yeah, I didn't realise that. I, I honestly thought that um, all elite athletes were just like, like, really itching to get out of the door all the time but ever since I um, made a motivation film just recently Ben Mouncey said the same thing to, to, from Team Innovate he said um, that uh, he it, 
it's really hard for him to get out of the door. And I just thought, wow, well that makes me so much more motivated because I know that he's going through the same thing. And so it's great to hear it from you as well. Ben lives in the same valley as me, so maybe it's like living in the middle of the, in the Pennines in the wind and the rain. <laughs> it's probably that, yeah. <laughs> See why I spend so much time like overseas, um, just because it's it's easier to go out when you're when you're in nice weather. Yeah, well, it is cool to combine running with travel, isn't it? Like, I, I love seeing the world through running. Yeah, um, yeah. If I if I couldn't travel with it, I don't know whether. Well, I would still do it. I do all the bell races. Um, but um, yeah, I love just. I kind of. I like to go to races based on where they are. So, like Costa Rica, for example. I've, I've been in South America. I've not been in Central America. So I'm like, cool. Go to Costa Rica and go out for a month. Spend some time in Panama. Go up some volcanoes. And then like the race. Yeah, the race. The race. Happens. The race will happen. Um, it's a really long way. Um, um, but yeah, using things as an opportunity to travel. Again, like that race in China, then stayed out for a while and travelled around a lot. Um, and yeah, I, it's cool. And of the race, you start to take it a bit too seriously. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I couldn't hear that last bit. I said I think if you just if you just go to a place just to do a race, then you start to take the race a bit too seriously. Um, whereas if you're on the start line, thinking, oh well, tomorrow I'm going to go and see this cool thing, or like got a week left to, to go and do something else and kind of make it as part of a holiday almost um, yeah quite a nice way of doing it yeah I think that's a really cool attitude yeah I really like that um, and we've got another question now from Paul Way um, and uh, he says why trail fell and ultra running why have you done that more than any other sports and do you do any other sports um, so I, I actually hated running when I was younger. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, now look at us. <laughs> yeah. Um, my, well, sometimes I still hate it when it's horrible. <laughs> um, but yeah, my parents were both runners, um, so I spent a lot of time as a child, like up in the mountains, cheering my dad on in fell races and things. Um, and so that meant we spent a lot of time hiking and things. Um, yeah, usual. Well, We'd be persuaded to go walking with the incentive of being able to play in the river or something afterwards. Um, but yeah, I, I played a lot of football when I was younger. Um, up until like till I was 22, 23, I stopped playing football. Um, so I mean, I was never particularly good, but I quite liked the, um, that team aspect to it. And uh, I spent time living in France and living in Spain. and. In each place, I, I joined a football team just because it was a really good way of getting to know people and meet people. Um, so yeah, I played football, then at school, like usual school things like hockey and netball teams and things like that. Um, but yeah, I guess like throughout that time, I also, like when I was about 12-ish, I started, started running a bit more seriously. Um, but yeah, I wasn't, I was never like that good, <laughs> um, which is why it always comes as a surprise when I do do okay in a race now um, but yeah I've also like I do quite a lot of cycling um, and I do I, I probably prefer cycling to running sometimes just because you can get places a lot more quickly um, so I've been on a few trips on my bike um, and you're I love just yeah I love just going off and like putting your tent on the back of your bike and, and seeing where you where you end up and you meet so many great people and people are always really happy to approach you when you're on your bike because you're you're not really a threat and um, it, yeah it's quite funny like um, some people think like oh if you're on a bike then it's like because you can't afford the bus and <laughs> people are nice and they're like you can food and things um, so, so yeah I love cycling as well. Um, Have you ever cycled to a race like Dakota Jones did uh, to the Pikes Peak? Um, not like a super long distance but I've done quite a lot of races whilst I've been on bike trips so like I cycled from Canada down to Mexico a few years ago um, and I kept finding races on the way um, like just totally by accident like I would just set up in a town and then there would be a post up for a race um, and um, yeah and then I would manage to get an entry for that race um, in fact like one day I put it was getting dark and I put my um, tent up um, just in a random field in the dark, woke up in the morning um, and there was some tape like just in front of my tent. Um, so I got out of my tent and I'm like, oh, what's this tape? This is odd. Um, and basically I put my tent on the route of a cross-country race. Um, <laughs> so, That's really uh, funny. So I managed to get the race organiser was like, yeah, okay, come and run our race. Like, you've 
left on the course. <laughs> That's really <laughs> cool. So yeah, I, I guess technically I have cycled to races. Um, and like in Mexico, I did just like stumbled across a race and won a turkey, which was um, <laughs> I had to donate to a good cause because it was um, quite quite hot. I don't think the turkey would have travelled well on my bike. <laughs> But yeah, I like. I mean, I mean, like then, like local races. Um, yeah, like just down the road and stuff, or in the next valley. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, have you ever tried? Um, Mark C says, have you ever thought of orienteering? He thinks you might be quite good. I have done some orienteering, like um, not that much. I did a little. I like. I remember joining the orienteering club at university um, and doing a doing a few like low key races there. Um, and I guess like fell running, you you usually have to navigate as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd like to do more orienteering. I don't know. I mean, I feel like I'm I'm okay with a map and a compass. I'm not like I'm not the fastest, but I can usually not get lost. Um, actually, I shouldn't say that because the next thing you know, I'll be lost. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I'd love to. And. Um, Actually, when I was, I lived in London for a while, and I, I did join an orienteering, like, I went to quite a few events there. They had some good, like, city orienteering races. Well. Yeah, yeah. Boxes. Urban O or something, they call it. It's really cool down there. And I thought that was great. And, like, it's, again, a bit like fell running. It's a good community of people, and um, everyone has a good laugh and drink in the club afterwards. And um, Yeah, I mean, there's loads of things I want to do. Um, and I'd do more orienteering if there was time as well. And, I do. I like the um, the challenge of it. It's not just who's the fastest around the route. There's a little bit more like intellectual um, like aspect to it. Like you've got to actually think and, and use your head. And um, yeah, I should do more of it because I think it would it would help to improve my map and compass skills. And, and yeah, my I'm not confident like with the like I'm I'm too slow. I'm not confident in like knowing like memorizing where I need to go next. I'm like constantly looking at the map. Um, yeah. So, that whole map memory thing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's uh, that's interesting because Rich Simpson has just asked about GPSs because um, apparently the Welsh Fell Running Association have just banned GPS devices. Um, so, yeah, have you got any views on, on that? I have one here. Um, <laughs> um, so, I guess, like, I've been brought up as a fell runner, so traditionally, and also my dad was a geography teacher. Um, <laughs> he's totally against... <laughs> and totally against like sat nav and things in the car and he always said like no when the, when all the satellites break and I will be the only one who knows how to read a map yeah <laughs> driving around in the apocalypse <laughs> I guess like as a child we would we would like go off walking and I would sometimes have the map and have to like follow the path or find out where we were etc um, and I mean there was no other option like GPS didn't really exist then um, whereas now like um, I don't know, it's a, it's a really tricky one. I, I'm not actually on either side. The kind of traditional conservative side of me um, thinks, no, we should, like, fell running is about, like, the sport is about, like, navigating, and um, and it's not necessarily just who is the fastest, it's who's the fastest, like, knowing their way when the mist comes down and the flag comes down. Um, and I do think it's really important um, to know how to use a map and a compass. Like, so many times technology fails, um, and it's all very well following a blue line of the watch, but the watch runs out of battery, or it loses the GPS signal, and you have no backup. Like that's <laughs> you've got a serious problem. Um, so, and I mean, there's argue, people argue, well, then it makes the sport not less accessible. People can't come and join, um, but there are loads of other races that people can do as well where you can use the GPS. Um, and there's the FRA and the Belgian Association, they run navigation courses. So I think like to keep it as fell running rather than it just becoming another trail race, um, I think it is important that it, it stays like that and, and we say, okay, well, you shouldn't be using a GPS watch. I mean, but then there's the counter argument of, well, then it's only fair for the local people. Like if I go and do a race up in Scotland, for example, or in the, even in the Lake District, um, and I haven't had time to go and recce the route, and then somebody who lives like right next to the course, um, who might not be as fast as me or as whoever else, um, obviously knows the course like the back of their hand. Well, <laughs> then they're obviously a, a huge advantage. Um, but but then that's 
that's how it is. That's spell running. Um, so, so yeah, I don't really have a huge opinion, but I do think it's important to know how to navigate. Um, saying that, me and my friend Katie, when we did this Coldwell Way, we actually did most of it just following the GPS on the watch. <laughs> um, it's, it's 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 a lot faster. Like um, if you've got it there, rather than constantly getting out the map. And, like I mean, we could have done it on the map, but it, we'd have been stopping quite a lot. Because it's quite a long drive route. Yeah. Both have their place. Yeah, yeah. I think it's just good to merge the two technologies, isn't it? And yeah. and yeah, there's you know there's a place for being able to map read, and then you also need to have some entry level stuff, but it doesn't need to necessarily be a fail race that where that entry level um, thing happens. Um, yeah, so there's, there are there are loads of fail races that are, are flagged as well that you don't need to navigate on. And to be honest, unless you're at the front. Um, which most women are aren't. <laughs> we <laughs> We're really have, we always, far behind <laughs> at the we back. Have some, we always have some men to follow. Um, like, you can often just follow other people as well. Um, you, like, you pick out which are the local club vests and then you follow them. Yes, um, yeah. And then they go off to the pub, uh-huh, they? And run to the so they just know the way around. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sometimes on the smaller races, if I get to a point where I'm running completely on my own and I can't see anyone in front or behind, I kind of pretend to myself that I'm winning. <laughs> Is that really weird? <laughs> I never am, by the way. <laughs> it's the mental games that keep you going. Exactly. No, it makes me just ease up because I'm like, oh, they're way behind. <laughs> um, so, yeah, just moving on from the concept of GPSs to more gear. So, um, Kurt Steed would like to know um, what kit you are using in your races these days. So specifically, he wants um, your what what shoes you're wearing, what GPS, and what poles do you use? Um, let's let's conquer the pole question first of all. Um, no poles for me. <laughs> no, never. Um, the only race I've used poles in was this Monterosa Sky Race, um, just because they were obligatory. We had to carry them. And oh, they, okay. They were awful. Um, I'm not used to using poles, and I have really, really weak arms um, and like zero pole technique. Well, I know, basically, I know how you're supposed to use them, um, but like, I think unless it's a really long race um, or like a vertical kilometer where it's really steep, um, then for me they get in the way. I like to run up a lot of the hills, and like, um, yeah, in that race they were not great. <laughs> um, so I'm afraid I can't share my any pole insights. Um, that is your poll insight. <laughs> that's my poll insight. That also, like loads of people in the UK have contacted me saying, like, oh, what polls do you use for sky races? And they think just because, like, just because you go and do a race overseas, or just because you go and do like the Glencoe Skyline and it's in Scotland, then it's called a sky race. Well, it's kind of a glorified fell race. Like, you would never use poles in a fell race. So no. You would be, like very much laughed at. Um, and so yeah, I. I mean, I think they. I do think they have a place in the long distance stuff. But I don't think I, I've not. I've not really got, got into the really long things. Um, but um, yeah. So sorry, no pole information. Um, GPS. I have a Sunto Nine watch, um, which is really good, um, and it tells me all sorts of things like um, how many hours I don't sleep each night. <laughs> and, um, it's. Um, it's super accurate in terms of, like it, it gives you heart rate like just on your wrist, which is really good. Um, and then like the ascent and um, and and it's and the distances are very accurate as well. I think. Um, so yeah, I've been really pleased with really pleased with that. Um, then in terms of like other kit, um, last year I was using a lot of Solomon kit um, and kind of varied the shoes were depending on on the terrain um but now i'm actually just about to sign a contract with adidas oh are you all oh, right you're moving from salomon so, to adidas uh, i was uh, yeah i was never really like i was an ambassador of solomon but not okay like, i was basically team holly page last year i paid for everything oh really yeah oh well yeah that's fantastic congratulations on the contract with adidas so yeah so i'll be i'll be using their shoes from Ah, do you? I've been, sent, I've been sent a couple of pairs, but um, since doing that very long run, my knees are a bit knackered, so I've not not um, not used too many yet. Um, and uh, yeah, so like I'm excited to to try out more of more of their kit, um, and 
and yeah, so my kit should actually like they should arrive later on this this week or next week. Um, Yay! That's really exciting. Um, uh, you know what? Yeah. I did um, my Bob Graham in a pair of Adidas shoes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, because the Brownlee brothers were sponsored by Adidas, so they used to wear for fell running. They wore the Adizera, uh, the Adidas Adizero um, X4 or something. So I got a pair, and they were amazing. But they've stopped making them now, so I I can't and I haven't found a pair of shoes as good as that since. Um, yeah, so they've got a partnership now with Continental, who make yeah tires. Uh, so they use Continental rubber on the bottom of the shoes. So they're yeah. Super- like they're really, really good, um, good quality. Like they don't, they don't seem to wear down. Um, and I'm actually going to to the HQ in Germany um, at the end, towards the end of January. Um, and we're going to look at developing some some shoes for 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 fell running as well. Like some Yay! Big, big looks. Um, so that that's quite exciting. That's I'm, really exciting. Like they're great for trail running. Um, but so far, I I think they need some with some bigger looks. Definitely. So, yeah. So explore that and so that's it's quite exciting um and and yeah they're yeah they're cool they've also like the shoes they sent have got off like i've only ever seen them in um in uh on cycling shoes like where you twist them to tighten the oh like, the boa closure thing which is great because it means you can get them really tight um which i've got quite long narrow feet so it's that's quite important um yeah um yeah, I've, I've not I've worn them for one race, um, but not like not worn them enough to have lots of comments. Um, yeah, I'll take them to Costa Rica with me for this coastal challenge, and I'm going to Gran Canaria next week for a race, so I'll wear them there as well. So they'll get plenty of hammering, I think. <laughs> that's awesome. I only know one other pair of shoes that has that boa closure thing, and that's I've got a pair of um, Asics shoes. Um, okay. I can't remember the name, but they've got the turny turny dial thing. Um, but I don't really like the turny turny dial because my feet are really low volume, so I have to really pull in the bottom laces. But the turny turny dial only really tightens it around the top area. So I just I find that I want to hoik them in all the way up because I've got a really low volume at the bottom of the lace yeah. area. Yeah, it, I find that if you pull the lace from the bottom as well, then that helps. Um, but I guess I guess everyone's different. So um, so yeah. yeah. It's hard. It's hard to find ones like that fit everybody's feet. Yeah, out. it's just good to have a variety of shoes out there. You know, like there's the Salomon lacing that that pulls up as well, and then there's traditional lacing, then there's skinny laces, fat laces, round laces, and then the boa closure system. I think it's just really good to have a range of options. Yeah, it is. And um, I mean, I'm very lucky that I get shoes sent to me, but for a lot of people, like it's not that's not possible. So I guess it's just a case of like trying out different shoes in the shop and then picking the ones which you think would be the um, the most versatile really and can, can work for um, on lots of different terrains. Yeah and do you ever find that shoes sort of like squish your toes in oh, a bit like this like sort of like they squish your little toe a bit too soon like yeah. that's what I find that in every single shoe I, I want people to make a shoe that's like a bit wider like this so can you um, ask Adidas if they'll do that? They're, they're, so. The thing I find about Adidas is that the toe box is too big. Oh me. no! You're gonna you're gonna make pointy shoes. <laughs> but that's perfect for you. So this yeah, is it's it's difficult for for everyone to get kind of the perfect. Oh, shoe. I'm gonna get in touch with them, and I'm gonna get on this trip with you because otherwise we're gonna come back with a pointy shoe, <laughs> and I'm gonna be like, oh no, I can't fit my shoe. <laughs> when they've got a big toe box, you'll like it. Yeah, I'll have to check them out. So, what's the the, the name? Do you know the name of the shoe, the uh, Adidas shoe? Um, I I have them. Like, if I'm allowed to leave the screen for. Yeah, I'll put I'll put a, I'll put a photo up. Let's let's just put. This is Holly's Instagram medley just here. So this is Holly holding a British flag and running around the Alps, and then we have Holly in Lamone running a race, and. Woo! Do 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 do. Boo! She's back. <laughs> and, um, I was wearing these yesterday, so they're quite muddy. Um, <laughs> these are the ones I was talking about. Um, cool. That's um, great. Lace tightening system. Um, yeah. You can pull them up from the bottom, and they 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 they're really light. Like they feel like a trainer, but with a like a decent sole on them. So. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, just hold it up. Um, I've got you on the full screen now. So uh, if you hold it a bit further back, then we can see the whole thing there. Oh, I'll just take the Holly Page text off there. Yes, there we go. Cool. Oh, they look really interesting. And could you just hold this soul as well? The, yeah. Ah, because the ones I've got aren't as deep lugs there. Um, okay. I, I'm going to ask if we can start to get to, I mean these are fine, I've worn them for a couple of fell, like for a fell race and I, I was up in Scotland just before Christmas running through like horrendous bogs um, and my brother was in a pair of fell shoes and I was in these and I was sliding around less than him so I mean um, yeah I, I'm quite pleased with them so far. Yeah they look good like they don't look like the um, the kind of real grippiness of the mud claw you know like the kind of football studs full-on grip but I mean yeah. that's good enough for like a mixture of most things isn't it that? things yeah and the fact that they're light and like a like a a, a trainer almost so yeah. I think for like longer things they're really comfortable yeah uh, what's the drop on those shoes uh, I should be able to tell you and I, that's the, this is the sort of thing I don't know about like, <laughs> like <laughs> when people would be like oh what shoes Yeah. So are they called the Terex shoe then? It says Terex on the side. Well, no, so Adidas Terex is like... Oh, well, that's the thing, isn't it? Like the outdoor... The range. Side. So yeah, so they've got... So Terex comprises uh, mountain biking, climbing, trail running. Um, so the trail running, like all of their trail running shoes will be Terex, Adidas Terex shoes. Um, and these are the, like, I think they'll call them the BOA 2, they're 240. Ah, uh, okay. They look really cool. They look quite. They look similar to the S Lab Ultra, but with a boa closure. Uh, yeah. I mean, they fit differently. So, like, the S Labs and uh, haven't got that. Like, this. This is like an integral sock almost inside. Oh right. Yeah. Oh, that looks comfy. And um, so it's almost. Yeah, it's a bit like wearing a slipper. <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> I have got to get me a pair of those. Right, everybody, note that down. I'm going to get one a pair of these. Um, yeah, and and I just find the soles really sticky. So I think, like, particularly if you're doing stuff um, on some drier terrain or rocky, um, I think they'd be good um, for sticky. Well, even sticking to wet rocks. Basically. Yeah. Well, that's what I found, and that's why I wore them on the Bob Graham because they even stick. Well, it's not that no shoe will really stick to really slippy wet rock, but they were really good at sticking to rock, a bit like Innovate shoes are. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, as I say, I've not I've not given them a, a full testing, um, but so far I'm I'm pleased with them. And I guess like Continental make mountain bike tires, and they're pretty grippy, so you expect um, you expect them to. Um, Sticky and things on the, on the yeah, um, oh, that's and great. And that's just trying to kind of break more into the trail running market. So yeah, um, oh, so, I will have to have a word. <laughs> quite, quite exciting, um, exciting times ahead. I think for the, the new team for the next few years. Yeah, that's really exciting. Well done. I'm really pleased to hear that. That's great. So I suppose um, you haven't had a chance to test the Adidas kit yet, but so, um, but do you have a favourite piece of kit, Adidas or not Adidas, that you would never be without? That question's from Helen Blakemore. Um, hmm, difficult one. Um, I really like, so since just I guess the last couple of years, I've always, I've been using like the running race vest bags, um, which are now made by loads of brands. Um, yeah. With like the little the little squeezy bottles, um, uh, they're kind of invaluable. Um, just having that the drink there. Um, I mean, I still like I went for a bike ride today with a bum bag on, um, and I like I'll ha keep things in there, and and I'll still run with a bum bag. Um, but for races and things, it's, it is really helpful to have the drink just there. Um, and yeah, like in the like shoulder pockets there, like and they just feel like a little waistcoat, don't they? Those um the running vests. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and I, I feel like I'm not, I, I don't feel like I'm running in a bag, um, so that's that's really good. Um, so I think that's definitely the piece of kit that um, that I, I wouldn't do without now. Yeah. Um, just, fit. you can fit all sorts of them, yeah. Yeah, I wonder if Adidas make one. I haven't, I haven't really seen much of their kit. 
Yeah, they do. That was one of my big questions before, like, before us agreeing to join the team. Um, I was like, I really need to make sure that you make these packs, and yes, they do. Yeah. Oh, I'll have to get one in because I'm doing a packs test like next week, so I oh, need okay. to. I need to. Well, I haven't received mine yet, but I'm assured. I've been assured by the team manager that they're very good. So. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That's awesome. Cool. So, um, uh, how are you doing for time, Holly? Have we got time for one last question? And then I'll continue eating the rest of my dinner. <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, we could chat, chat about Costa Rica whilst you eat dinner if you want. Um, so, John Gardner um, asks the last question here, which is um, he asks you to set aside um, for a moment your inclination to be modest, um, um, but he wants you to explain the source of your remarkable courage, which manifests in so many different areas of your life. That's a lovely question, isn't it? The source of the courage. Yeah, yeah. Where do you get all your strength and courage from, do you think? Um, I honestly think it's come from childhood. Um, like, yeah, my parents were teachers, so we had like, really long family holidays. Like, not loads of money, but plenty of enthusiasm, or at least they did. Um, and so we would just like, go off on our bikes. Like, I mean, like, when I was 10, I think, or my brother was 8, like, we cycled from coast to coast on our mountain bikes like, with a panniers on the back and you've got the wind blowing in your face and rain and um, like pedaling over the hills and like I'd have a little speedometer and it would go to zero and I was like but I'm still moving <laughs> and like things like that even though I didn't necessarily enjoy it at the time it was, kind of, it was just like normal that's like that's what we did um, and like walking up mountains and things when it was really miserable weather um, I think that kind of toughened me up um, and and then like as I say, I did lots of other things as well as running, um, and I always have done. I'm kind of like an extracurricular kid at school, um, so and I guess like always trying to find the time, like always trying to squeeze like life's just a jigsaw, of, like squeezing everything in in terms of like how do I get to this activity and then like go from my orchestra rehearsal to football training to then like do some revisions to my exams and blah blah blah. Um, and that like wasn't just the school and the university. I would, like everything as well um, and it makes you kind of quite disciplined um, because there's so many things I want to do um, and I find I guess this is the lack of modesty bit but like I'm, I'm quite good at managing to get lot do lots of things um, yeah it's like, brilliant and just kind of making the most of it um, like I'm not very good at sitting around doing nothing I feel like even if I'm doing some like stretching or like cooking or something um, like I'll always be listening to a podcast so I can be learning and yeah I, I don't want to waste any time I, I rarely like think oh I'm bored I'm gonna sit and watch TV or something there's I'll just learn. so much to do isn't there um, something useful um, or informative um, but yeah I think like yeah from a young age I was kind of without having much choice <laughs> um, made to be reasonably determined um, and and also, I was so bad at running, like when I was younger. But I did all the fell races, and so like you're kind of forced to be fairly resilient um, when you're like trooping along at the back, like trying not to be last. Um, then, um, then yeah, yeah, you it makes it makes you a bit stronger. That's a better way around to do it, really, isn't it? Like being a bit rubbish when you were younger, and then just kind of really blossoming as an adult, which you've definitely done. So, it's a really good way around to do it. But yeah, I feel a lot. I do most of my success comes down to like working really hard rather than actually being talented. Um, <laughs> like, I know how to push myself quite hard, um, which helps. Um, but, but yeah, yeah. Brilliant. Well, it's been so amazing to chat to you, Holly. I've had a really, really lovely evening spent with you. And um, just to recap, everybody, um, Holly Page. Oh, it's this way on the uh, on the on the split screen thing. Um, uh, Holly is a world sky running uh, classic category champion, which is amazing, and third in the Golden Trail series overall. And um, 
top 10 and first great uh, British runner at the Trail World Championships. So I'm just going to read out some comments to you, Holly, because people have been commenting as we go. So I'm just going to, they've, they've, Helen B says, this has been fabulous. Really enjoyed tonight's chat. Um, and uh, um, lots of people are saying that you are brilliant and you've answered their question really amazingly. That's awesome. And Paul Way has said, um, oh, he said, lovely answer. Thank you. So grounded. And um, Guy Greater X says, um, great chat. Thanks, Holly. And Run Simon Run says, really enjoyed this live interview. Holly is so normal and down to earth and yet it achieves inspiring, um, amazing things, a real inspiration. So yeah, everybody's really loved the chat and it's, it's so good of you to come on and share all your thoughts and answer everybody's questions. So I just wish you like all the best of luck with um, with a new sponsorship with Adidas and we'll, we'll definitely be keeping track of your progress. And just one final question, what is next for you in 2019? Oh, so many things. Um, but immediately next is I'm going to Gran Canaria for a week um, for a race um, and then I go to Germany to talk about shoes um, and then I go to Costa Rica and hopefully down to Panama as well um, for all of them and then uh, more of more of the same of kind of like doing more sky races hopefully um, and I hitchhiked to most of my races this year but I'm looking at buying a van um, for, um, for this year so if anyone's selling a van I will get in touch. Fantastic! Um, yeah, yeah and I can pick up the hitchhikers rather than Yes, yeah, wow, yeah. <laughs> that sounds like a great idea. That's awesome. Well, thank you ever so much. It's going to be a fantastic 2019, and hopefully, we can check in with you later on down the line. Um, but uh, thank you. I'm just going to say thanks for watching, and then um, after the live, me and you can have a bit of a chat about Costa Rica if you, if you want to. Um, and so, I'm just going to say thank you ever so much for everybody for watching the live chat. Um, I'm Claire from Wild Ginger Films. Subscribe if you haven't already and um, uh, look for me on Patreon if you want to win some exclusive competition prizes. Um, this has been Holly Page, uh, Sky Running World Series Classics uh, category champion, and um, I will see you all next week to chat about uh, top of the range running backpacks, and if I can get my hands on an Adidas one before then, then I will show it to you then. Okay, thank you for everybody for watching, it's been amazing, and thank you very much, and bye! <laughs>